Welcome. Hello. We are already laughing, so we're hoping that you all laugh a lot this year. Welcome. Not to at Mom us, Life. but with us. With us. <laughs> with us. Welcome to Mom Life. We're so excited that we get to get going again. There's ten. There's there's. Four of us. There's two people that are really helping this situation did, this year. I know. How did that happen? Like, I don't know. I but I'm know. thrilled. I think last I, we were sitting on my couch and then we prayed and then boom they showed they up. They showed up I and know. I think someone decided that we needed help. Big help. <laughs> so let's start with an introduction. There's a lovely lady. I mean everybody knows who you are, but just in case. I'm and Susan. a little something about yourself. Okay, I'm Susan Webley. Um, I help coordinate mom life. I have worked at the church for almost 11 years, which I love. I have been part of faith since, let's see, 20, 21 years now. I have three children, two (laughs) grandchildren, and a wonderful husband that puts up with me. (laughs) Thank you. And you like to golf? I do like to golf. Mm Mm-hmm. And that many other wonderful things. Yes. <laughs> well, just in case you're new to mom life this year, I'm Linda Jarms, married to Dan, three adult children that are all married, and one precious little granddaughter, Remy, who's five. So, and what I like to do, I love to drink coffee and sit around and tell stories. That's pretty much. I yes. Cook. And I like to cook. Uh, yes, I cook uh, you good pasta. You come over. Okay. 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 That's it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Are you? Do you I know, know you? Us? I, I, I am Kelly Dean, and I am married to Dan. We've been married 39 years, and we have three kids and three kids in love and 7.2. Seven grandchildren. We have one more coming in November. And we've been at Faith Bible Church from the beginning, and we serve as counselors at the church. I had to think about that for a minute. What do we do? What do we do for fun? Well, we like to swing dance, we like to eat, and we like to have deep conversation. Mm-hmm. As far as hobbies, those are probably right up. How about you? Yeah, I'm Wendy Doherty. I am married to Dennis, and we've been married almost 30 years. And if you care, in June, that would be 11,000 days, which is a cool little fact. I keep track. We have four kids. One is married. um, And we just sent our last baby to high school today. Just kind of a milestone. No, it was actually great. Was it great? He's ready. It was exciting. I handed over my carpool keys to the best carpool driver ever, his dad. Awesome. So it was great. We like pickleball, even though we're not old, and we like <laughs> fishing too. So that's the Doherty's. Yay! Yay! Well, this year in Mom Life, first of all, we're going to have our format be a little bit different. So it's going to be shorter so that you all have much more time in your groups to talk about the things that you're learning and to cry about how hard it is sometimes to be a mom. And we're also going to try to have a little bit more of a conversational style rather than just one person talking and the lights going out, but a little more interactive. And this is the first time we've done it that way. And next month it might look a little different, but we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're changing it up a little bit. So um, we are going to get started on what we're going to talk about today, which we are all, this group, we are very, very excited about the focus on our identity in Christ. So we started Mom Life studying the Psalms. We did that for a couple of years, and then we studied the I Am statements, and now we're going to talk about who are we because we belong to Christ. And the world likes to tell us, who we should be, and Pinterest likes to tell us what we should be and what we should look like and what our home should look like, but you know, we want to know who we actually are because of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're studying this year. So let's pray. Lord, I pray as we talk about our freedom in you that this will prick each mom's heart, each woman. I pray that she would say, oh, I need to think about that. I need you to change my perspective, Lord, and help that help that help me live differently. So I pray for that today. Thank you that you love us. In your precious name, amen. amen. 
So we talked about the fact that we're going to be studying our identity. And last month at our kickoff, which was amazing, we um, started a little bit with talking about our identity is in Christ and our identity comes from the fact that the Lord made us. The Lord made the world. The Lord made humans. And so all of this is his idea. It's his plan. And we learned that in Genesis 1 through 3, where we talked about how God made us. And then we spent a little bit of time in Ephesians 1. And I have just been thinking so much about this from the last month. It is incredible that God would love us so much that he would bless us with so many blessings. He created the world and he created us to glorify him. But then he gives us all these gifts. And while sin destroyed the harmony between God and man, Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for sin and brought great blessings to us as his children. And I made a brief list of those blessings. Here's a brief list from Ephesians 1. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. We can be holy and blameless because of his choosing. We are predestined and adopted. We have the forgiveness of sin. We have his grace lavished on us. We have an inheritance and we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's just a little bit of Ephesians 1. We are made new because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And when we think about who we are, we need to think about ourselves in light of that. You know, one of the results of that blessing is that we are free. And as Christian women, our identity is we are free. We have been freed. So think about that. When we're saved, if you're a saved woman, which we pray you are, you get changed by Jesus Christ. And then we continue to be changed by Jesus Christ until we see him face to face. And we're not just changed, we're made perfect for we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, if you got that figured out, please explain it to all of us (laughs) because the Bible says that, but in my mind I still think, really, what does that look like? I can't quite picture it. But my hope is in the beauty of what that's going to look like, seeing him face to face and being changed. I, I'm so thankful and excited about that. Jesus loved me and he loved you and he gave himself for us. And now life is different. And we could talk a lot of the time in this group about how hard life is. And we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about what we have. <laughs> we're not, we've just lived through some fires and some hard things. I want us, and those are hard. I want us to focus on some blessings and some, some encouraging things. So if you have a Bible with you, please turn to John 8, <clears throat> 31 through 36. I love this passage. This is the Lord Jesus talking. And it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So think about slavery for a minute. You know, we, we studied slavery in America in school And we know that slavery continues to happen today all around the globe. So think about a slave for a minute. A slave is not free, right? A slave is bound. A slave is held, tied up in bondage. Before Christ saves us, before he saved me and my sisters here and you, you were a slave to sin. All you could do was sin. We could only sin. That's all we could do. 
apart from being set free. And in addition to that sinning, we also carried the guilt and the shame and the heaviness that that separation from God and unresolved conflict in our lives brings. That's a heavy, heavy, heavy burden. I think most of you know what that feels like. That dread of, ugh, I did it again. That dread that says, oh, I should do something about that, but I can't, I can't face it. There's no way that I can fix it, and I, I, can't, even, I can't even look at that. It's, it's a horrible thing to sin in a way where you know you've already done it, and you've already asked for forgiveness. And, of course, before we're Christians, we can't help but doing that. But after Christians, we still struggle with that battle of sin. And this is where this discussion about freedom is going to really be helpful. Um, so I'm just curious with you all, is there something in your life where you say, oh, this is the thing I keep going back to and I keep, I keep begging Jesus to, to heal in my life? For Go sure. Ahead, Susan. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that comes to mind when you say that is, um, I clearly see everybody else's sin before my own. And I think that's a sin right there. Mm -hmm. I think I, I see it um, in the way people talk or interact. And I think, can't they tell what they're doing? Mm -hmm. And then when I turn the finger back at me and look at myself, I say, oh, I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The sin is very evident um, in my own life, but I see it very clearly in others. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that I, I struggle with is just wishing that I could tell them what they're doing, mm -hmm. but I should clean up my own, mm -hmm. kind of mind my own business. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Oh, that's a great example. That's a great example. I was just thinking about <clears throat> how it's very easy. I'm really good at this multitasking sin of being whatever I'm doing, but my brain is just going and I'm, looking at something from every single angle and usually not thinking rightly about it, right? Thinking um, like this, like, why can't other people be like mm -hmm. me, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't they just be like me? Yeah. Instead of praying for myself to be more like Christ and for other people more like Christ. But I, I can go through my day. I can parent my kids even when they're little. Um, and, and I can... My brain goes and goes and goes while I'm doing dishes and while I was changing diapers and while I was doing this and that and the other. It was a wonderful giftedness not to mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes by the time my husband got home, I would have this thing that was maybe this big be this big mm -hmm. and often like, ah, when he walked in the door. Mm -hmm. So I think it's re for me, it's really about setting my thinking on the Lord and not on myself, not on what I'm not in control of, not in other people, not in how I think things should go, but in, yeah, I just, it's constant, like, haven't you learned yet? Mm -hmm. Haven't you learned yet? Yeah. You've been a believer for however many years. Haven't you learned yet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good one. Kind of a little bit like yours, Wendy, as I was thinking about this, um, the sin of trying to control my life mm -hmm. and control people around me and, and mm -hmm. situations around me. So I don't have to suffer because I have a big idol of comfort mm -hmm. and anything that feels hard or has the threat of being hard. I just don't want anything to do with it. So that manifests itself in I'm going to control the people that are close to me and I'm going to control my life to try to control hard, which you, you hear yourself say that out loud. Like that's insanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who can do that? Nobody can do that. And God works in the hard, um, but it does, it's been a besetting sin that I've had to keep working on that I have not gained complete victory over. But the Lord keeps showing it to me more and more clearly and more and more fully what the actual idol is. And, you know, it's interesting, though. We, we can figure out, I know exactly what idol it is. I know what I'm worshiping. And that still doesn't mean you've even come close to conquering it. You have to replace it with something. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we recognize it and we can kind of almost brag about it, like, I, I know what my idol is, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, 
you can still be like, why am I reacting this way right now in this situation that just makes me feel out of control and I'm anxious or I'm angry? Um, it's because I haven't replaced that sinful desire with the glories of Christ and saying, not my will, but your will be done. And I just love this topic of I positionally am free from that sin of needing to, to control my life, mm. from that sin of trying to make sure nothing hard ever happens to me or to people I love. Mm. I am free from that. How do I live out of that reality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't you think that's a little bit like laying that idol or that sin at the feet of Jesus, and then you go and pick it back up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I pick it up all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to take it back on my shoulders, and I'm going to try to fix it again. Fix that person or fix the situation, mm -hmm. like you said. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look at the freedom, the freedom to leave it there mm -hmm. and not keep picking it back up mm -hmm. is what I think mm -hmm. I need to focus on. And I, I know it, mm -hmm. but I need to do it. Yeah. It has to be replaced. It's kind of like digging a hole in the sand. Mm -hmm. If we don't replace it with something better, a better affection, a better mm -hmm. way of thinking, mm -hmm. We're just going to fall right back into that hole again. And, and sprain our ankle. Exactly. <laughs> Which we're not going to go there. <laughs> I think the one for me that is kind of a, it is a besetting sin, is self-pity. And I can feel sorry for myself better than anybody I know. And there are all kinds of things that happen on a daily basis or an annual basis where I think that is not fair that hurts. Why is this happening to me? And I, I, I would say that personal personality wise, I have a very melancholy personality, and I always have. I can remember in third grade on my report card, my teacher said Kelly does really well in school, but she cries a lot. Oh, and I. So <laughs> those of you who know me are like, well, I know that, <laughs> but. So I feel things deeply, but I also feel for myself deeply. Mm -hmm. And then I'm getting my eyes on me and being hurt or feeling lonely or, you know, there are a thousand iterations of that. And again, it's not believing that I have everything in Christ. And I hate that sin because suddenly I'm not thinking about the person across from me, my husband, my children, my girlfriend, saying, they're loving me by spending time with me. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. And um, I'm, I'm hyper aware of that, and I keep doing it. So I, it's that's one of the ones for me that when I thought of asking this question, I thought, well, you got to confess that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, which does make me think of Romans 7.15. In Romans, it's talking about the law of sin, and that is where Paul says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Mm -hmm. Haven't we all been there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a song, I did it again, I don't remember who sang it, that's not what I'm talking about. But we don't we say, I cannot believe I just felt sorry for myself today, or I just judged that person today, or controlled that person, and we hate it. We hate it. And you know, the Bible says that it's a law that we want to do the right thing, but because of sin, we find ourselves unable to do so. We get so frustrated with ourselves, the same repeated wrong thing over and over. But the good news is, because we are in Christ, because he has saved us, we are not bound to that law. I can not sin. And did you notice the punctuation of my sentence? I can not sin. Hmm. We can't. <laughs> we still will. <sighs> I don't quite get all that sometimes, but, but we can not sin. We are free from the bondage that comes from the hopelessness of sin. Because of what Jesus did on the, on the cross, that law has lost its power. We can not sin. 
I love Romans 8, 1 through 3. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, there's a new, there's another law, mm -hmm. has set you free from the law of sin and death. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could mm -hmm. not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So we can not sin because we are free from the bondage of sin. Um, I looked up in a concise dictionary of the words of the Greek New Testament and Hebrew Bible what it means to be set free. And it means to be liberated, exempt, delivered, to be made free. So it's actually, it actually kind of means what it says. Do we live that way? Do we live that we are set free from the bondage of sin? Do we live every day saying, I don't have to do that wrong thing? Probably not, but we could. <laughs> we need to help each other remember that. The truth of, of life is that we were born sinners and we cannot please God. But if you are in Christ, if he is your Savior in, and Lord, you are free. Girls, you are free. You are free. Without Christ, there is no hope or freedom or ability to fix ourselves. That's what we learn in John 8. Being in Christ, we are free. We are set free from the power of sin and death. That pull that says, I can't help it. I can't help it. That's not true. We are set free from the penalty from our sin. Sin and death is a law, and only Christ sets us free from that. And the penalty, apart from Christ, is eternal separation from God. And if you're a Christian, that you're not under that penalty. So I like to talk with children, and I'm going to show you at the end um, this little backpack illustration. And when we talk about kids... Remind me, I'm going to show you that because I think it really helps us. But remember, if you have got sin that you won't repent of and you won't let your freedom in Christ free you of, you are still living in bondage. Even though positionally you aren't in bondage, you're still walking around like you're in bondage. And that's not the abundant life that Jesus promised us. In that passage in John 8, it says, If you abide in my word, and my word abides in you, you will be free. So, in order for all this to make sense and change how we live, we need to know God's word, right? We can't do it on our own, and we sure can't make it up. We need the word of God. As a child of God, remember what a, a Romans 8 1 says, There is no condemnation for you. There is no more bondage. Your life isn't purposeless. It's actually profoundly purposeful. Mm -hmm. We will not be sinless until we're with Christ someday. And until then, we're going to battle our flesh, won't we? We're going to battle those sinful desires that want to keep us close to Jesus. When we sin, we do feel bad. But remember, there is a difference between conviction and condemnation. When we have sinned against God, the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin, and we are driven to repent. Conviction is not condemnation. Condemnation says, or conviction says, oh no, that was wrong. Go back to the Lord. You did it again. Ask the Lord's forgiveness, right? Okay, Lord, I did it again. Please forgive me. That's what conviction does. Condemnation says... You are a failure. You are a total screw-up. There is no hope for you. That is condemnation. The Holy Spirit does not speak to us that way. The Holy Spirit does not condemn us. We're convicted of our sin. But think about that. Jesus doesn't talk to Christians that way. We talk to ourselves that way sometimes. And I think that's not have, how he talks to us. We have an enemy. That, and the enemy talks to us. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. We're believing that. We're believing yeah. a lie of Satan. A lie of Satan. So when you are convicted, sisters, repent. Then move on. 
you are not in bondage. That's such a, when I was a young mom, if I had thought that way, I probably would have been a much happier (laughs) young mom. (laughs) But I was lugging around my own sin and I was looking at my kids' sin all the time. Mm -hmm. And I just, I didn't know this principle very well back then. And I certainly didn't let it change how I lived each day. We are free from the power of sin. We all have been made new, and this is something that we have to rejoice over. The world has nothing like this to offer us. Nothing. It's, it's not out there at all. This only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one way that I like to direct my mind is focusing on the promises of God. And boy, if you do a little study on the promises of God, you're going to find more than all the journals you could ever afford to buy. And so as I was writing this, I thought, let's share. what What's one of your favorite promises of God? Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be your all-time favorite favorite, but I think it would be fun to share those. Mm-hmm. I think as we were, I was thinking about this topic, I'm not sure if it's a direct promise. It's a reality Um God has given us His Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, um, even here as I was looking at John, uh, at Romans 8, for all of us who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be leaning into that with our identity all year. Mm -hmm. The fact that that is probably at its essence what we really mean by being in Christ. We are His children. Mm -hmm. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons of God by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Mm. So he's given us his Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit takes that truth that Kelly was talking about and um, brings it to mind in our life. Is if it's If we're taking it in, the Holy Spirit will then Bring it to remembrance at that time when we are tempted to sin. Mm -hmm. So I love the promise of the fact that as a daughter, the Holy Spirit lives inside me to both convict me and help me understand Scripture and help me remember the Scripture that I have um, studied throughout my years to help me fight sin. So I I just thank Him. Thank Him. I don't, is that a promise or is that a reality? I don't it's know. It's both. Okay. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Susan, how about you? Um, I I was thinking about um, one of my favorite scriptures, which is Psalm 121. Mm-hmm. And there's several promises in the scripture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read it and kind of highlight some of those promises. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? And that's me as a mom crying out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know he can, he can be my my help and my rock my help comes from the lord the maker of heaven and earth first promise he will not let your foot slip he who watches over you will not slumber indeed he who watches over israel will neither slumber nor sleep the lord watches over you the lord is your shade at your right hand the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night the lord will keep you from all harm he will watch over your life the lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore he doesn't promise we won't have hard times that is not what this is saying but he will walk through those with me Mm -hmm. and to me that's one of my greatest promises whether i was a a young mom Mm -hmm. trying to raise my children the very best way i could it it really didn't matter um to um I, I would look at this and say, the Lord will help me through this. My children are not a reflection of my parenting. And that is something I think a lot of young moms take on. Mm-hmm. If they behave badly in public, you think, oh my goodness, everyone's going to think I'm the worst mom ever. Mm-hmm. And he promises to walk through that with me. And then you come through the other side and you start over. Mm-hmm. Every hour is a new hour. Every day is a new day. And you just keep mm-hmm. on doing what the scriptures ask you to do as a parent, as a mom, as a grandma. Yes. Because we're talking to a lot of mentor moms, too. So Nothing nothing your kids do, absolutely nothing your kids do, even at church, <laughs> in front of everybody, or changes the, your identity in Christ. Exactly. Yeah. That can make you a more confident chilled out mom when they get in trouble with the Sunday school teacher. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I have so many stories that I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Wendy, how about you? Do you have one that you want to share yes, with us? Yes, I really like Philippians 4, 19 and 20. <clears throat> and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I love this because <clears throat> he's going to meet the needs that he knows I have, not the needs, not my wants. Right? Mm-hmm. He's able to parse out. He knows my sinful, wicked heart that wants what I want. And he's going to give me what I need, mm-hmm. not what I want always. But he's going to meet my needs. Great. Right? He's going to always meet my needs, but it's for his glory. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say, to Wendy, be glory forever and ever. <laughs> it says, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. And that lifts my gaze here instead of my eyeballs looking at myself. It's so good for us to think about promises that the Lord has given us because that stabilizes our soul and helps us remember to think on the truth instead of on the lies that Satan wants to tell us or the lies of our own heart. As we close this up, I want to think about how we could teach this to our kids. And remember, a lot of your children are babies, and so they don't know the gospel They're learning the gospel from watching you and teaching them that they're free. That's a tricky thing when they're this young most of the time because we're actually wanting them to see their sin (laughs) and not think so highly of themselves. It's a tricky balance, I think. So again, this backpack illustration, and you could do it however you want, but when your child is struggling with a sin of disobedience in a certain thing, have them, um, This is I do this with kids a lot, we're going to write that sin on this brick. Like, let's say I lie. We're going to write lie on there. And then I've got a backpack over here. Let's say I steal. I'm going to write steal. Let's say I hit. I'm going to write hit. And then you fill your backpack, the backpack up with all those bricks. (laughs) It's real heavy. And you have them walk around with it. Now they can't. And then you say, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you can use this to show them how much they need Jesus to set them free from their sin, that they can't set themselves free on their own. So that's a little idea from you. I'm gonna for you. I'm gonna close us in prayer, and we can't wait to hear how your groups go. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have set us free. Thank you that you chose us before the foundation of the world, and you love us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.